a decision, a very intentional decision several years ago, there was a, a world where we'd say, hey, you know, we're going to be a very simple listing site. We're not going to be in the weeds and it's going to be sink or swim. And I don't know, maybe that would have been a good idea. I, I, I can't tell you, you know, we, we didn't choose that path. Uh, but what we believed, one of our core convictions is that because this is different for a lot of investors, because it's a, a different set of tasks, because it's long term, you know, unlike, say, an Airbnb, where if you it's a bad experience, you did it wrong, whatever, you shut it down. They're gone a weekend later. For us, these are, these are long-term tenants, right? The average stay is about 10 and a half months. So if someone moves in, you're not set up for success. Not only are you going to have a bad experience, that bad experience is there to stay. Welcome, everyone, to the Cassandra Properties Podcast. We're joined today by Frank Furman. He's the Chief Operating Officer and Founding Team Member at HadSplit, which is an absolutely remarkable innovation as far as I'm concerned. So Frank, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. So maybe we can start just in your words, give the audience an overview of what exactly you're doing there at Pad Split, and then I've got so many things I'd, I'd like to question you about. Yeah, absolutely. So, um... Hadsplit, we've been around for about four years. We're headquartered in Atlanta, but we're, we've sort of expanded throughout the Southeast and are kind of going from there. And what we are at our core is we're an affordable housing company. We're a mission-driven marketplace uh, that's not that dissimilar from Airbnb in terms of how it's structured from a technology product. But as opposed to an Airbnb that's fractional in terms of time, where you have one you know, short-term rental, another short-term rentals, and so on, we're fractional in terms of space. And the demographic we serve is, is really workforce housing. So from the landlord side, it looks relatively similar. You take a property, perhaps different from an Airbnb, but it's a, a furnished property and you list it on our, on our site, on our platform, and then it's rented out by the room effectively. And, and the reason that we've uh, been so successful so far that we've got a long way to go is we generate significantly higher you know, above market yields for investors. So uh, the idea is, you know, if you're a renter who's, you know, working and we do kind of credit check, income check, you know, uh, background check, the whole bit, employment verification, um, you know, but perhaps aren't making enough to really afford a market rent. And obviously those have gone up in, in essentially every metro area. Um, you can rent a room for significantly less and save a significant amount of money. And it's it's a lower barrier to a uh, to clear in terms of uh, you know first and last month's rent and so on, it makes it very hard for people to crack into the traditional rental market. So very clear uh, value proposition for the renter and then for the landlord to make more money. So that's that's kind of what makes what makes us work. So uh, housing insecurity mm -hmm. is an issue that I think unfortunately we're we're going to just see increasing. Uh, the pressure is going to increase in the short term and, and likely the long term because of so many things that are happening in the marketplace. I'm just curious, you, you've got an engineering background. Uh, I understand you served in the Marine Corps and thank you for your service there. Um, how, how did you end up with a passion for, for you know, how, how do you go from, you know, engineering backgrounds and in, in the military to affordable housing? I, I think my mother's asked me the same question a couple of times. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, really. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in real estate investing. Uh, my my brother-in-law, Atticus, who's our CEO, so I've, I've known for for a long time. Um, this really was his his kind of passion. His he kind of stumbled into it uh, around 2009. He was uh, you know I knew him at this point. I was, uh, I was at that point dating his sister, um, and you know he he was a commercial broker here in Atlanta, and you know he's buying up houses. His timing was good, right? Obviously, the market had had recently crashed. And, you know, it's just renting them traditionally, renting them section eight and so on and so forth, because the houses were just available for so cheap. Um, so we bought a house, Southwest Atlanta, it was kind of cut up funny, didn't think anything of it. And two neighbors came by and they said, hey, you know, our house is being foreclosed on, we want to rent rooms in your rooming house. He says, ah, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. It's just an, a house. I'm like, well, you know, we'll pay you, uh, you know, a hundred bucks a week. And he's looking at it and he's saying, okay, I got this many bedrooms. I can get 800 from the housing authority, a hundred a week, four or five bedrooms. Hmm. You know, and he's, despite his not having an engineering background, he was able to figure that out pretty quickly. And so he did it and then did another one in 2012 and, you know, come, uh, you know, 2017 or so, 
you know, we're, I'd, I'd moved to Atlanta that year, the year before, um, I'd been in management consulting and, you know, was a little bit bored. He'd, he'd essentially, uh, had this string of businesses that all been quite successful and he's, you know, but he kind of, they, they'd sort of run their, run their course and they were kind of running their, running themselves. And he's like, you know, I've had this idea kind of kicking around in the back of my mind. And I was very familiar with his business. I'd been investing in projects and, uh, apartment buildings and houses with him for, for kind of, uh, about eight years prior to that. So familiar with his team and his, his approach and, like, you know, what would it take to scale? What would it, what would it take to do this? Not as a, as a side hustle, not as a house here or there, but how would you do it here? How would you do it everywhere? How would you do it, um, you know, a, across the country, across the world? And, and at the time, and, and it's only kind of gotten more pronounced since then, these, these factors have made it even more important. And, uh, you know, the, the conversation around affordable housing, obviously asset prices have continued to increase. Um, so there's been all sorts of factors that have really been tailwinds for us um, one of the things that is, you know, you kind of said it, it's, it's perhaps regrettable, but you know, a lot of challenges in our business, lots of things that keep me up at night, uh, a lot of things that are, are just hard. But the one thing that's easy is knowing that there's just huge unmet demand, you know, that yeah. everyone I talk to across the country, you know, they'll, I, and I talk to people, you know, all over and they'll say, no, Frank, what you don't understand is here, we have a real affordable housing <laughs> I got it. You know, it's, it's true. Um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's in kind of top tier cities. It's in secondary cities. It's in uh, not even urban areas at all. It's, it's a challenge. And, you know, so I actually got interested in the concept because this is what I did in grad school. I was, uh, I'd left the Naval Academy. I was, I was going to grad school, Johns Hopkins, and I, I really needed about six months. And, you know, I needed flexibility. I was a young second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. i well, I actually felt pretty rich because, you know, I didn't really have any expenses, but I'm like, oh, you know, how do you even do this? How do you, how do you rent a room, you know, or how do you, how do you rent an apartment? And, and so I rented a room in a house um, and did it, you know, and it, I saved some money and it was flexible terms and it was furnished and, you know, that it made a lot of sense for me and where I was in life. And then, you know, you get a little older and, you know, I'm now married, I have three kids, but you think, Hey, the, the mechanism that I was perfectly capable of using at that point in my life isn't open to a lot of people. You know, I was a student and relatively high, you know, social network, you know, so on. Um, I had a very short haircut, you know, <laughs> in terms of being clean cut. Um, and for some reason, if you're working uh, in a manufacturing plant or as a security guard, those options aren't, aren't open to you because the, the market just hasn't kind of met that need. So I mean, how do you make that opportunity available to everybody? So um, I think it's really interesting. You, you hit on a couple of things there that are just core to what we're doing. And, and I think so few get this piece of it. Being in the real estate business now, I don't care what side of the real estate business you're in, um, but if you, if you want to do anything in, in scale or anything significant, we, we've had to become a tech company mm -hmm. over the last 10 years. You know, it used to be, we would seek out the best deal makers. And of course, the, you know, the, you need the best deal makers in a transaction if you really want to drive value on, on one side or the other. But we had to become marketers pretty quickly. Yeah. And considering, you know, the, this digital age that we're in, that meant that we had to become tech company. You know, we, we went in and we brought, brought a CMO in who came over um, and spent a bunch of time at Apple. And it profoundly changed how we do business, you know, there's an adaptation period and there's a bit of a buy-in period, but once you get the systems kind of rolling, um, you need technology in, in basically every corner of your business to scale. So uh, to frame the issue for folks, I thought maybe we'd spend a couple of minutes talking about what those kind of tailwinds are that are creating this demand. So from what we've seen, there's several factors. One, uh, in, in at least where we are, there's been a, a big push against any upzoning. There's been downzoning everywhere. Legislative threats um, are abound where, where you know, the elected officials are focusing on <clears throat> less density, right? Which means bigger lots, less vertical housing, um, and just far, far, far less units per acre than existing zoning or previous zoning. We've been through multiple iterations of these down zonings. And as you go through those down zonings and the homes become bigger, they become more expensive, right? So your, your product is, is in, in volume dropping, prices are soaring. 
and then you sprinkle in um, these interest rates, which have been just absurdly long, low for so long, uh, the housing prices just continue to soar, yep. uh, and wages are not matching that, and that creates this this crisis where we just simply don't have uh, housing that is on par. I think it used to be like 25 or 30 percent was what average folks were spending on rent. And from what I've read recently, it's as high as 50% of their income is being spent on, on their rent. Yeah. And it's just, it's completely untenable. So to build affordable housing, at least up here in New York, it is a extraordinarily uh, specialized field, right? You have to be able to yeah. um, have access to the powers that be, you have to be able to negotiate very complex uh, tax credits and grants and subsidies from HUD and other other governing bodies. Many times you have to go through a lengthy approval process. And, and on top of that, oftentimes, if you've gone to the city for assistance with zoning and, and with credits, they want to require union labor, which drives prices way up. And, you know, it just, it be becomes this model where so few are, are able to do it. Um, that you just don't have the production in, in any kind of scale way. So what you guys are actually doing is you're taking, now does it, can it be a, a, a home? Can it be buildings? It, does, it, does it matter what the typology is for the housing? We're totally agnostic. I mean, the most of it actually is in single family homes, just because that's the best yield for investors, but we're in multifamily. Um, we're for us, it's a matter of, you know, you need to meet code, you need to have a, a space, but we're, we're agnostic to where it's, how it's zoned, what kind of structure it is. So uh, we're seeing companies, you know, uh, follow the path of the decentralization of real estate that I keep bringing it up. I've been talking about it for five or six years, um, and we're seeing it in a major, major way now. Companies like Divco West and Blackstone are pumping billions of dollars into the single family home yeah. market. Uh is that your client? Are you working with the funds or is it Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Both. Um, so, you know, and hopefully a lot more both to be honest, but um, yeah, we have, we have clients that are, are those, you know, wall street backed funds. Absolutely. And they're, they're looking at their business and saying, Hey, I've got a relatively low yielding assets that depend on appreciation. And how do I boost those yields to, a long tail of, of absolutely, you know, kind of mom and pop retail investors who have, you know, it's a side hustle for them. You know, they've got one to five properties um, and this is, this is something they're doing on the side. So yeah, everything and everything kind of in between. So again, we're, we're relatively agnostic to it. Um, and our view is it, it, it can work for, for either type of investor. All right. So if, if we can, I'd love to walk the audience through and I'd love to learn it myself candidly. Uh, can we talk about from start to finish, uh, you know, I have holdings, I want to go ahead and rent out the, the house or, or the multifamily building. Let's say, let's start with a, a three bedroom home, yeah. right? So Perfect. I'm going to contact, I'm going to contact, I'm going to contact Frank and, and your company. How do I do that? Where do I start? Yeah. I mean, as far as for contacting me and that's, and that's great too. I'm just Frank at padsplit.com. We're not too inventive. So you can reach out directly. Um, you know, if you if you don't want to talk to me, and, and there are many people who fall into that camp, sales at padsplit.com. Right, the royal you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, indeed. Uh, but you can come to me directly. I'll, I'd be happy to happy to handle directly. But and it's and it's an interesting point because unlike uh, maybe maybe an Airbnb or something, we get very involved with investors even pre acquisition. And the reason for that is that this is a challenge. We're you know we're we're going to go through the the steps and so on. It's not rocket science exactly, but you know, this is a, it's a new kind of model for a lot of folks. It's a different way of looking at properties and different way of looking at management and renovation and so on. While none of it's complicated, there are a lot of moving pieces. So, you know, we, for us, our growth lever is investors getting good outcomes. When that happens, they tell their friends, they add more properties. You know, we're, we're maybe not all that good at sales. We're good at driving yields. And so that's, that's the only way we get, we get to grow. So, we tend to be very, uh, we get involved very early and not a day goes by that I'm not working with an investor saying, hey, I like this property or I don't, you know, I like this one because it is, you know, it's on a corner lot. So it was more street parking versus this one's on a cul-de-sac. So it is less and, and, and we'll get to that. So again, we, we get involved very early on. Um, 
with folks. But the way that it looks like from the investor's point, you, know, you come talk to someone at pad split or, or what have you. And, and really, we, again, we're, we're usually looking at either assets you already own or assets that you might want to buy. But let's say you already own one. You know, we'll take a look at it, uh, you know, desktop research and say, okay, you've got this 3-2 in this zip code. You know, what do we think about and do a quick assessment? You know, we have an earnings calculator on our site. We essentially build a pro forma with you to say, hey, is it a good fit or a bad fit? You know, is it big enough and so on? And in terms of what an investor is looking for from a, from a buy box perspective is, we tend to like larger homes, you know, that can get to more bedrooms because that'll increase your yield, make it more profitable for you, more affordable for the renter. Um, they're obviously, you need to have a certain threshold of bathrooms as well because you can't have, you know, 10 people sharing a bathroom, at least not successfully. Um, but, you know, we like a little bit bigger. We like to be close to employment centers or public transit, very important for us. And there's a little bit of an art and science to say, hey, here's a property. Hey, it has great street parking or it's close to public transit or, hey, there's parking around the back. Those are the kind of things that uh, make it a little bit easier for this model. Because again, in, in terms of how you want to look at an asset that's a little bit different, if you're going to have more people, you could have more cars. If you don't want your neighbors to be, uh, you know, walk around with pitchforks mad at you, uh, you know, it helps if, you know, there's easier parking situations or fewer cars. So, you know, planning factor from that front. But again, larger close to public transit or, or urban areas. And, and we kind of go through that whole process with folks, um, you know, build a pro forma, you know, let you get a view of what your, your net operating income is going to be to see if it's a good fit and if it's the highest and best use. And again, that's part of what we do too, is oftentimes telling people, Hey, this property would be better as something else. You know, you're right. you pursue your highest and best use. Um, so we get involved in that part, you know, and then the, you know, the, the investor commits or decides to buy the property and that's great. We have a preferred vendor network, both of brokers and general contractors and, and property managers and all the markets we're in, we're obviously always looking for more, uh, but oftentimes are referring folks to a general contractor who understand the process or in other cases are working directly with uh, the general contractor to help them think through it. And again, nothing, nothing cosmic on the renovation side. Most of what we recommend folks, and we have documentation and uh, you know spec sheets and so on help folks with process, but a lot of it's the same things you should do for any rental property. You, you, know, you want solid surface flooring and, and all that kind of good stuff, neutral tones, you know, you don't want to be too adventurous. You want it to be easy to clean, easy to operate, but some things are different, right? So a, a good example is around utility. So part of our model, just like for Airbnb is that your utility costs are borne by the landlords. So you have to bake them into the price. And, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> But with, you know, so okay, how do you drive down those costs so that you can, so it can be more affordable for them, more profitable for you. So we're very involved in thinking through, hey, you know, you want, there's a Niagara 1.25 gallon per minute shower head on Amazon. It's $8, buy it. It's your fastest payback investment ever. Go do it. You know, half gallon per minute aerators in the faucets. You know, you want a smart thermostat that you lock with a pin, you know, because if you control the thermostat, you're controlling HVAC, you're controlling most of your electricity bill. So talking through folks with that, which is just, a, it's not in most investors' muscle memory to think through, you know, utilities and how you drive that down that spend because typically tenants are paying that bill. So we're, we're quite involved there and, and hopefully helpful through that process. Also how to divide up the property. Um, you know, sometimes it's as easy as hanging a door, you know, in a case entry. Sometimes it's putting up a wall to uh, turn a, you know, a living room into a bedroom and so on. So we're, we're all about showing folks how to, capture and monetize underutilized space. And, and kind of to our point around housing is, you know, most houses were built with a family in mind and room rentals are, are buying something else, right? What they're willing to pay for, what they value is a bedroom, a share of a bathroom, a share of a kitchen. So you want to optimize around those revenue generating units and not around extraneous you know, things that don't generate revenue. So you really want to kind of boil it down to that. So that's, that's where we kind of fit in. So again, oftentimes we're either recommending a general contractor or working with the general contractor so that the investor can be successful. And same thing with the, you know, from there. So we, we kind of walk people through the process, help out where we can, you know, help them with the listing. Creating a listing is very similar to doing what you would do with Airbnb, upload pictures, you set prices, um, relatively straightforward. And then, you know, our, our platform is set up to help host manage the actual property and the, the way that it's broken down is, you know, what we do for hosts is 
you know, I refer, we, we talk about the four P's, right? So the first P is payments. We do all the payments, all the collections. So any conversation around money, hey, I, I need an extra day or hey, I, you know, I want to talk about my late fee, all that handles. We have a whole team of folks who are doing that and call, text, email. So that, that we do. We do all of the, all the lease about the, the second P is people, right? So anything, um, getting them in the door, all the lease up, marketing, screening. Again, we do that credit check, background check, income verification, employment verification, any of the interpersonal stuff. You know, we have a 24 seven call center. So, you know, oh, uh, Johnny ate my peanut butter, Sally looked at me funny. Those calls come to us and our team is really trained to de-escalate those situations. You know, hey, have you rated Johnny? You know, we have a rating system. Have you have you thought about transferring? Sometimes that's the release valve that's needed, and that's one of the benefits of having a network of these of these properties. So we handle that. Uh, anything on platform related, third P. You know, so I forgot my password. Obviously, that comes to us. And then the fourth P is property. That's what is essentially on the the host, right? So we have a ticketing system within our platform that's native to our platform. So if there's a leaky sink. Someone submits the ticket, everyone else in the house can see that ticket, you can correspond on it, dispatch people and so on. So anything that touches the property is, is the host responsibility. Again, very similar to Airbnb. And, and that's how it, how it works. And obviously we have a customer support team that, that supports our host network um, through that process as well. So if I'm, if I'm catching this correctly, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm pretty surprised at the level of involvement this isn't the site where you go and you just upload some pictures. There's quite a bit of support that's coming from your end here. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, our, our view is, um, you know, we made a decision, a very intentional decision um, several years ago. You know, there was a, a world where we'd say, hey, you know, we're going to be a very simple listing site. We're not going to be in the weeds and it's going to be sink or swim. And I don't know, maybe that would have been a good idea. I, I, I can't tell you, you know, we, we didn't choose that path. Uh, but what we believed one of our core convictions is that because this is different for a lot of investors, uh, because it's a, a different set of tasks, because it's long-term, you know, unlike say an Airbnb where if you, um, you know, hey, you have a guest, it's a bad experience, you did it wrong, you know, whatever, you shut it down, they're gone a weekend later, you know, you're not dealing with it. Um, for us, these, these are long-term tenants, right? The average stays about 10 and a half months. So if someone moves in, you're not set up for success, not only are you gonna have a bad experience, that bad experience is there to stay. Um, and it's bad for them, it's bad for you, it's absolutely bad for us. And um, so we, we made the decision to say, look, we're gonna lean in very heavily to ensure, especially early on, um, that hosts are successful. And it'll mean saying no to business. It'll mean getting more involved than we'd like to sometimes, you know, and, and taking some risk on referring vendors and, you know, getting involved. And, being a little more customized than we'd like to be. And, you know, fortunately we've been really pleased with the fact that, you know, none of it's, again, like we've, we've developed a lot of expertise around it, but, you know, our hosts are smart people too, you know, and they, uh, they figure it out and, you know, you, sh you work with folks on how to do it. They learn, they, they innovate, they, you know, they kind of put their own twist on things. They, they try and deliver a superior product because it's a marketplace and, you know, oftentimes we were probably too concerned early on that hosts wouldn't, wouldn't get it fast enough and we needed to really kind of inspect and check. And the thing is because people vote with their wallets, um, you know, most hosts are pretty savvy about saying, okay, well, what, what are people gonna like? How am I gonna please my customer? And if I do more of that, I'll be rewarded. And, and if not, I'll be punished and, and they kind of go from there. So, so early on, we really like to lean in. So uh, are you outsourcing a bunch of this stuff? Do you have VAs that are handling a lot of this work or is this? Um, so it's, I mean, it's essentially all in-house I and mean, we do have some overseas folks on our uh, customer support team and we do have a, an outsourced call center for more kind of transactional calls and so on. But our, we have a U.S. team for escalations. Um, our host side is all U.S. based. So they're, um, I mean, they're all over the country now because we're, we're in a couple markets, but uh, no, I mean, they're, again, when I say uh, email frank at padsplit.com, it's because I, it's, it's coming to me. No one else is looking at that email, I hope. Um, and, you know, we, we get very involved uh, within, with our hosts. Uh, and how long is the average 
uh, stay for a guest or a, uh, I guess yeah. the, you know tenant in yep. in their room? Is this a, a, a three month, a three year, or three day? So it, it's the average is about ten months. So some folks are a little bit shorter. Um, one of our kind of key insights that we had early on mm -hmm. was that having the long term commitments isn't super helpful for a lot of these folks. If anything, part of the value proposition is having that flexibility. Now you commit to a month up front, um, but our view is that, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, workforce housing, you know, you have job churn, people can lose their jobs, you know, that, that can happen. But having a long-term lease doesn't give you a lot of security. So it's better to say, all right, hey, this didn't work out, you know, let's move on from this um, if, if, there's, if there's an issue. But if you're providing good product, people stay. So we've had folks with us for years. Uh, is how is the institutional debt market receiving this? Are people yeah. able to refi yeah. cash out and 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 stabilize? Absolutely. It was it was definitely a struggle for for the first year or so because you know lenders like to see things fit inside their box. You know they'd rather see fifteen hundred bucks on the first, fifteen hundred bucks on the first. You know one year lease, you know, so on and so forth. And here we are with, because it's weekly payments, because you might have five of six rooms filled and then six of six, you know, you variable payouts. And so it, it, it kind of, uh, and early on lenders really kind of pushed back, but what they saw was the debt service coverage ratios were so much higher that, you know, it's like, okay, well, you don't want to, you want to see 1500 bucks on the first. What about 32, 15 and 65 cents. Does that bother you? You know, what if it's 35, you know, 23, you know, in the second month. So um, we've been really fortunate and we, we put a lot of work into it to build out a network of lenders who get it, who are comfortable with it. Obviously we had to, we had to put in the work and prove it over time and, and share a lot of data, which, which is, which is fine, but it's at the point now where if you want to get long-term debt, it's, it's very easy. And, and fortunately the good side of having really low interest rates is that all the lenders are hungry and they're chasing yield and they're, they're dying to push out money. So it's, you know, that, that hasn't hurt either. And, and you, so I'm going to, I have 10 properties with pad split and I want to go for a portfolio or just a simple house refinance. Right. And the yeah. bank's asking me for all these documents. Are you guys getting involved in that process? Am I referring them to you and you're producing a report or is that a concierge level service or so the, we are oftentimes getting a, a little bit involved. I mean, the, the reporting on our platform is typically sufficient for what uh, those folks are trying to see, but we are, we are sometimes getting involved. So yeah, that's, that's something that we'll do, um, especially around the documentation, because people have a lot of questions about the lease. So I mean, again, I'll, I'll talk to appraisers from time to time. I'll talk to, talk to lenders on behalf of, of hosts. So when, when those questions arise. Okay, so if we could spend a couple of minutes on on the payment waterfall from the tenant, right? So the tenant's paying pad split. Yep. And then pad split is paying the investor. Exactly. Okay. And are they paying you guys, the tenants are paying you guys through a credit card port portal or cash or, or check or yeah. what does that look so like? It's all electronic through our platform. So we've, uh, I mean, we have a third party payment processor um, software that we use, but all electronic payments, credit, debit, ACH, they pay on their dashboard, you know, in the app, that kind of thing. Um, and what we're really doing is just aggregating all these payments because, you know, you have a house, our average house is, you know, six or so bedrooms. You have, uh, so you have six or so people paying, you know, four and change times a week. And you know, you're talking 20, 30 payments a month. So what we do is we roll that all into one payout at the end of the month um, for for investors. So uh, so that's that's kind of what we're we're doing on our end, and we we take a percentage of it. And are the tenants mm -hmm. on any voucher programs? Are you guys taking subsidy, or is this? So that is a really interesting question. I actually met with uh, the secretary of HUD about a year and a half ago about this very issue. Um, and HUD actually recently released guidance based off that, it was, it was more than me in that room, but uh, on that conversation. Um, and the, the fact is there is no federal uh, restriction on using HUD funds for housing choice vouchers, but it is up to the local public housing authority. Um, there was some uh, guidance in that document, which was again published a couple months ago 
about how public housing authorities ought to pursue shared living uh, and, and subsidies. There's some operational challenges to it, candidly. I mean, you know, there's the tools for how you price rooms are different from how you would price houses. There's an experience there. How you would run inspections is a little bit different, but we're we're quite bullish on getting a, a pilot together with, with the public housing authority soon. There's a lot of demand there. A lot of cities have long waiting lists. They're very strapped. We could be, and, and singles are the hardest uh, demographic for them to serve, and that's kind of our bread and butter. So rather than doing a full, you know, apartment or house for a single, which they're loath to do, um, you could do a room and, and you know, that, that would obviously be a lot more cost effective. But uh, today, other than our network of kind of nonprofit um, and corporate kind of sponsors who will do some rent assistance for folks, um, we, don't, we don't have any public subsidy through, you know, housing choice vouchers or anything. Okay, so the, the, it, I applaud you for being in the room with, with, with the decision makers a year ago on this because again, technology is disrupting the markets so quickly and and folks that would have access to subsidy right but can't find the traditional housing stock as these funds are pushing in and buying you know literally whole neighborhoods up sure. uh, it leaves people in a bit of a lurch so I'm, I'm happy to hear that that is in the works and and good luck with it because i think that's a game changer for you guys as that yeah. kind of shakes out um look, i have so many questions so who's setting uh pricing like it, you know I'm, I'm here in staten island and i've got holdings up in honesdale right in yeah. jessup two completely different markets how do i get a, a quick sense of this is what what it's going to carry here and and are amenities a factor in that is it very yeah. house specific uh, yeah i mean down to the room you know the, the individual rooms are being priced um we have a pricing tool native on our platform that pulls from a number of different data sources, including other rooms that are local. So again, if you're pricing a room in Atlanta where we have, you know, a couple thousand rooms, it's got a pretty good idea, right? It's, you know, it has a huge data set. Um, and, you know, we're, okay, we don't have any rooms in Staten Island yet, um, but, so we wouldn't have that, but what we, we pull from other data sources, including kind of fair market rents with HUD and so on. So we have, we have a, we give a price suggestion, but the pricing itself is on the host. Oftentimes we're asked to help and we, we will talk through uh, you know, strategy and so on. In new markets, it's a little bit tougher because it's a little bit less established. There isn't, you don't have the same robust data sets like you do for traditional rentals or for say hotel rooms or that kind of thing. Um, so that, but it is, it, it's really on the host. Amenities do matter, but honestly, the biggest amenity is private bath. So that's, that's about a, you know, 30 to 50% price increase, because that's what people care about. Amenities beyond that, even size of the room, so on, or, you know, matter less um, for folks. But location obviously matters a whole lot. You know, something that's right on a, a bus stop or, you know, better neighborhoods, you know, it's, it's like anything else. But, um, but yeah, we, we have a supporting role there, but it's, it's up to the host. And then we allow for price adjustments over time for folks because sometimes you know underwriting is not easy sometimes you, you know you whiff a little bit your utilities are higher than you planned or you know what have you and you know they they can change over time so we have some constraints built into our system you can't up someone's rate on the second week or anything you know if you wait a few months you have to give a month's notice and so on mostly for you know just fairness and compliance reasons but uh, but we we allow folks to adjust over time too okay so you had said uh essentially on suites or, or one-to-one -one ratio is a 30 to 50% premium if there's yeah. a private bath in the, in the bedroom. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when do we start getting into diminishing returns where you have issues with tenants? Is it three bedrooms to one bath? Is it two? Is it? Great, great question. So um, yeah, there's, there's a few in there. So one is uh, we mandate that you need to have at least one bathroom for every four bedrooms. So if you have, a, you can have a, you know, a, a seven, two, that's fine. But if one of those is an ensuite, it doesn't, it doesn't fit, right? Cause then you have six sharing one. So that's, that's one constraint. Um, really where you tend to get to it is around uh, using the kitchen. So, there isn't an exact number, it depends a little bit on the size and you can put in a second fridge, but 
at some point, you know, maybe it's nine bedrooms, maybe it's 10, you know, what have you. And some properties are that big. Um, you get too many people sharing a kitchen and just, uh, it gets messy. It's hard to tell who did what to whom. Um, so that's, that's definitely one, uh, one topic that, that kind of gets there. But I mean, other diminishing returns that are maybe on the easier side, you know, above a certain size, room size doesn't really help you. Um, you know, really above about say 120 square feet, no one's paying for extra space, you know, to have a yoga studio or anything. Um, so it's really kind of, you know, you just, it's, you know, it's a rental, you know, no one's buying. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty reasonable, but yeah, there, it, it, there's a few things. I mean, there's a, every property is a little different. Um, now we have folks who are doing built to rent, um, even kind of retail investors who are doing it at scale and, and building it out new. And those are all the same floor plan, but, um, for the most part in our kind of background was, was doing rehab. So every house is just a little bit different and they're all kind of, you know, they look a little bit the same, but they're all a little bit custom. So, uh, what are some of the, the notable markets that you are in and what are some of the notable markets you're not in currently? Yeah. Well, no, uh, notable that we're not in, I, I suppose is New York. Uh, yeah. but yeah, today we're in, uh, we're kind of all across Georgia. Atlanta's our flagship market. We're in, I don't know, 15 or 20 counties, uh, a whole lot. We're in Florida, kind of Jacksonville to Tampa, kind of that whole swath there. Uh, Texas is a big market for us. Houston, San Antonio, Dallas. We're in New Orleans. Um, we're in Richmond, Virginia. We're, we're in Indianapolis. Um, so we're kind of over the next couple months, we will certainly expand in all those markets and we're, we're very active in them, but we will be adding, uh, you know, likely North Carolina, probably Vegas, Phoenix, um, Ohio, probably Chicago, Minneapolis. Um, we're looking hard at the Mid-Atlantic. I'm from Philadelphia originally. We're, we're taking a really hard look at Philadelphia, kind of Baltimore. New York's a little tough, candidly, um, for all the reasons you mentioned before. It's, you know, it is not the easiest place to be a landlord, far from it. Um, and it's And it's pricey. Uh, certainly in, certainly in the city. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to make the deals pencil. There's, so there's, that would be a tougher one for us. Same could be said for much of California where, um, again, tons of demand for affordable housing. Some of that is because it's such a hard place to be a landlord. Um, you know, obviously there's some cause and effect there, but, uh, California, we're, we're pretty bullish on parts of Southern California. We think we can make it work. Um, we expect we'll probably be there at some point next year, but today we don't have anything in California, even in the pipeline. Um, but in general, we're, we're focused on kind of the, the Sun Belt and the Midwest, just because that's where the, the highest yields are, you kind of the most regulatory friendliness, um, and they're kind of the, the easiest places to get going with investors. So um, I, I assume that the, the regulatory uh, nonsense in New York is, is one of the big reasons that you've stayed away. And quite honestly, why we're seeing this continued decentralization out of these major cities, yet sure. it's a place where we need something like this just desperately because there's just an awful shortage of affordable qual quality housing. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process of, of starting a fund up mm. um, that is it's going to run a, a pretty wide gamut from entitlement plays to um, we're, we're trying to identify underutilized assets in emerging markets, right? So we've kind of got our secret sauce. And some of the things I've seen recently with coronavirus is a lot of the smaller like B&Bs and a lot of these smaller motels just got absolutely crushed, right? Yeah. So we're able to pick up these, these deals. I just literally looked at one yesterday um, and for the energy, even with Airbnb, for the energy to get, because uh, hospitality is another animal, right? That's a whole nother ball game. Um, but there, there is an opportunity that where, where you've got facilities and, and in some cases it's even a commercial kitchen. Uh, in some cases we've seen efficiencies where you can actually cook right in the room. Yeah. Um, if we were able to pick product up like that, where you had these small kitchenettes right in the room, does that play for you guys or do you need the traditional housing stock? No, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've looked at a lot of uh, similar types of deals, whether it's kind of small apartments, um, the sort of subscale, sort of, uh, you know, too small to have on-site management jobs or even motels. Uh, so yeah, similar, 
yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of the same things in the market. And the fact is, that's a really compelling uh, value for a lot of folks because they don't need a ton of space, don't want it. It's great to have your own bathroom and own space to cook, but you don't have to do yard work and you don't have to worry about this or that. And location wise, they tend to be just off the highway with parking and all those things. And so there's a lot to, lot to like about it. So no, that's, that's absolutely feasible. Um, okay, so I, obviously this is very market sensitive. So let's assume we're talking about one of your premier markets, Georgia, Florida, Texas, New Orleans, uh, yeah. Indy. Give me an idea of occupancy rate and default rates. Yeah, so our occupancy rate, we we average in the low 90s um, once once things are stabilized. So we we target filling up every house in 21 days. Don't always quite get there. In Georgia, we're a little ahead of that. In Houston, we're a little behind. So it can be market to market. But um, our view is we you know we only get paid when we fill them up. So that's that's what we pride ourselves on. So we keep things in the low 90s. Um, as far as you know, kind of bad debt or collections rate or you know, however you want to think about it, uh, we generally average about 96, 97% collections rate. Um, now that's that's inclusive of late fees and so on. But you know, our view is we want to be able to underwrite really low income folks to a you know to a high income, middle income standard. So we work really hard on that on that front. It doesn't work for every single person, but part of the point is you diversify across a larger group of folks. And even when one falls short, you know, other folks are, are kind of doing fine making it up. So yeah, we're at, we're about 98% in 2021 for collections rate. So pretty. Uh, That's absurd. That's an absurd rate. Clearly I'm, I, they don't put me on the collections team because I am either too nice or too incompetent, but we have, we've actually like uh, good people on it, I suppose. No, the, the best performing managers in the country never sniff that kind of rate ever. Yeah, we're, um, we put a lot of work into it, that is for sure. And, and I mean, some of it is, you know, if you think about uh, a big, not that we in, invented this per se, but we're very customer focused, not so much in saying, okay, you know, how do we think about the space and so on, but collections is a good example where landlords, you know, they, they want you to pay on the first because it's easy for landlords right? It's easy for accounting. It's what the banks like to see and so on and so forth, but it isn't very customer focused, um, especially as you move down the income ladder. We bill weekly because one, you keep on people, but two, it's much more intuitive for folks. So, you know, when's the first of the month? I have no idea, but when's Friday? Well, I know that's tomorrow. I get paid on Friday. I get my bill on Friday. I pay it by Sunday. Okay, great. It's much more intuitive. And we actually build out the software to allow folks to move their payment day to their payday if they so desire. So if you get paid every other Wednesday, you can get billed on every other Wednesday, that's fine. That's some of the flexibility we build into it. And the idea being, how do you make it as easy as possible for people to pay and the most, you know, catering to them rather than making it easy for landlords. Now then of course we aggregate and send it to the landlords in one bill, but, um, but yeah, it's kind of shifting it around to being more customer focused. Now, I assume you guys are, are dabbling in, or certainly I'm sure you've contemplated it because, I mean, I'm, I'm really blown away at how thorough the platform is. You're helping tenants establish credit. You're giving them the opportunity to report. Yeah, we're actually, uh, we teamed up with a company based out of New York called Suzu that does our credit reporting for them. And, um, you know, most of the folks who are in our houses are, you know, not necessarily bad credit, but oftentimes no credit, you know, thin file sort of folks. Um, many are unbanked. And by teaming up with Isuzu, which is a team we've known for a long time, they actually just raised their Series A, uh, really, really good group of guys. They, uh, you know, because you're paying weekly, you're actually getting four data points each month or four or more. So for folks who don't have much of a file, you know, they stay six months, you're talking, you know, 26 um, uh, rent payments effectively. And so we're seeing average credit scores really go up quickly because, you know, you have this long track record and many, many, many data points, much more so than you would for normal rent pay. So um, yeah, that's been, that's, you know, it's part of our value prop to to the members, the residents. And so, all this. so just to explain to the audience, because I, I, you and I knew what we were talking about, but for their benefit, uh, what Frank's referring to is uh, as these tenants are uh, making their payments, their platform is actually reporting to Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion 
payments on a weekly basis to help uh, some of these folks. Honestly, it helps them pathway to home ownership because uh, oftentimes they don't have a lot of credit. And by making those payments weekly or biweekly, however it's, it's being done for that individual residence, uh, Pad Split is then reporting to the agency that they're making the payments on time, thereby bolstering their credit score, which, you know, again, it's, it's you guys have really covered the gamut here and I'm super impressed with the platform. It's a great benefit. Um, if a, a tenant is in, I know you mentioned 21 days for a lease up typically, mm -hmm. If a tenant is in for their 10 months or 12 months and uh, the house has been vetted already, yep. you've turned folks over, what is the typical downtime from a tenant vacating to a new tenant being in and paying? Oh, typically less than two weeks. Um, so the, essentially what happens from a, a product perspective is, you know, I'm living in room two in one of your properties. I decide, hey, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm moving, you know, or I'm, I, I'm getting my own apartment, whatever. I select my move out date in the future, right? So I'm going to move out in two weeks, fine. Well, you get a, a ticket in, in the platform that says, hey, you got to go turn room two on, you know, whatever, the, the 14th. Okay, fine. Um, so when that gets done, it gets relisted. And, and the, the room turns are very simple. And that was kind of one of our, also one of our early insights is that, you know, in traditional rentals, you know, you think you're making money, you think you're making money, and then your tenant leaves after two years and you say, oh, I got to dump four grand in this house to repaint, fix this and do deferred maintenance. And I'm going to be down for two months because I'm going to fix it for a month. I'm going to do a month of lease up and, you know, I'm not making any money. For us, you're only turning the room. So you're not really touching the common areas. You're very, very rarely doing anything, paint, whatever. You know, it's much more Febreze and Swiffer, you know, change a mattress cover than, you know, a, a rehab. So usually... The, the room turns take an hour and are done by a you know maintenance guy. They're very simple. So they cost, you know, call it 50 to 75 bucks. It's covered by the move-in fee, you kind of go from there. So then it's just a question of, okay, now that I've uh, turned the room, now it's relisted the same day as soon as I click it to reactivate it in the platform. I mean, we have rooms in Atlanta that have been booked for move-in the following day, but on average, most people move in, we, we let people book a room, you know, up to a week out. So, you know, there's usually a little bit of time while they're waiting for their move in and, and so on. But, but yeah, usually it's filled uh, pretty quickly. And the eviction rate across the portfolio, mm -hmm. when you have uh, someone that's not performing or, or, you know, yeah, kind of no, causing an issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. It, uh, Pre-COVID, I would have said we don't really even ever evict people. I think we had one pre-pre uh, pre COVID, and you know I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but uh, eviction moratoria collectively have not been super helpful to us or landlords or, or anybody in my mind. But um, well, these are anomalistic times, so let's yeah, yeah, let's exactly. focus pre-COVID. Oh, yeah. Sure. Right? Um, so yeah, the way to think about it is um, we've always framed that occasionally an eviction is needed. Right, you need to do a formal eviction and go through the courts. And, and candidly, that's one of the challenges of moving into a market like New York that is much less landlord friendly than, say, a Georgia or a Texas or a Florida. Um, and evictions take a whole lot longer and a lot more expensive. Um, in the many other cases, because we have folks who fall short, you know, that's the reality of working in low income housing. There's, you know, you can pretend that it doesn't happen, but it absolutely happens, it happens all the time, usually for collections related reasons occasionally for behavior, but usually for, for money. And what we do, and, and this is again, something that our, our collections team is doing is we have what we call, you know, an easy way, hard way conversation with everyone. We say, look, you know, we're all adults here. Door one, you know, it's your choice. Door one, we shake your hand, no hard feelings. We don't send this thing in. You need an extra day, not a big deal. Uh, you know, it's fine. We have a whole suite of support services for folks that, you know, we can refer you to support, you know, shelters, that kind of thing. No big deal. This won't, uh, this won't follow you. It won't be on your record. Part is friends. Door two, file for eviction. In, again, the states that we're operating in, it's just a question of time. And usually it's pretty quick. You know, again, we've been in anomalous times, but uh, usually going to be pretty quick. And we're going to send it to collections. You're going to get a dispossessory. This thing's going to chase you. 
and you know every time you try and uh, get an apartment this is gonna be on your record and you might get turned down you know you want to get a job this is gonna pop up so again like it's it's your choice but you know whatever and most people are pretty pragmatic right and it, I think if you treat them as as adults and make it their choice you know again some people they they want the hard way you know that's that's life um, but most people look at it and say look I, I need an extra 48 hours and say okay like let's do that and let's you know, shake hands and that's fine. Um, so that's, that's how we've always approached. We've had a lot of success with that method. Again, the last year has been a little bit uh, harder on that front with moratoria, but, um, but we're pretty confident that that will kind of get back to being the norm. But it's, you know, we're talking lower than single digit percentages. So again, it, it figures heavily in my mind and every time it happens is, uh, is a miss, whether it was screening or dysfunctional or, or just bad luck but um but it does happen so we have to be prepared for it and we paired with a kind of national uh eviction service for hosts so they can kind of not have to deal with it too much for folks that don't want to deal with it and and who's handling the filings or, or is it just referred to the landlord or it so the we've we've partnered with this this company that will do it for the landlord on their behalf but they're they're handling the filings and we will liaise with them on the documentation. And, you know, a miss is a miss, right? It's ri risk is inherent to everything. It's certainly speculative real estate. And if there's a miss, I assume the landlord bears a hundred percent of that expense and it is what it is, correct? That's right. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, a rating system or is there, um, you know, a way there's different, different investors have different appetites for risk, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I have holdings in, in state, out of state. Um, I tend to be more risk averse when mm -hmm. it's out of state because it's not in my backyard and, and I, I want these things to run as efficiently as I can. Are, are there rating systems where, you know, I can say, hey, Frank, you know, this is an asset. I don't need every dollar out of it. I'd rather have someone with you that's tenured, that's been with the company for years, that's moved from place to place, that has a good record. Like, is there a record like, for landlords and tenants? That, that's a great question. The answer is today, no. We're, at, we're working on a beta um, rollout of, of something that would effectively let you do that and, and adjust your screening criteria for folks. Today, our system does not do that candidly, but I think within the next year, we'll be we'll be rolling that out where you could where you could effectively set custom limits for or custom uh, requirements for that. To some extent, you can use uh, costs for uh, for that as as a proxy, but you know we prefer to be a little bit more customized in the future. Interesting. And what happens, uh, do you deal with, I know singles with a preference, but there must be instances where there's families, right? H how do you treat that? So really not, we're, um, today we're singles only. We, okay. uh, we, we have done couples and, uh, and with kids in the past, but really while we do have a few that have been sort of grandfathered in, with, that have been with us for a while, we, we neck it down to just singles during COVID and, and tend to keep it uh, kind of permanently. And our view is, there's huge demand for singles in the in the marketplace. It's it's kind of the hardest group for folks to serve, um, and yeah, it just it just makes everything a lot easier in the houses. And you know the you know again like one of the questions that I oftentimes get from investors is you know oh you know I, all these people in a house I bet you have lots of fights and the answer is not really not relative to my traditional rentals because people fight but you know, husbands and wives fight, boyfriends and girlfriends fight, you know, people who know each other and care about, you know, my two sons are fighting in the other room, like savages. Um, <laughs> but strangers don't fight, they're petty and, and weird, you know, and uh, passive aggressive. So, you know, introducing couples uh, or children introduces a lot of risk on that front for the for the host and the landlord. So uh, we've, we've tried to de-risk that as much as possible. So yeah, we're, we're singles only. So when I'm, I'm building out my pro forma, Mm -hmm. for a property for you guys, uh, what kind of a, a insurance increase do, do I anticipate? Depends a lot on the market. Um, so in Atlanta, we've, we've built a couple of relationships where with investors or with uh, insurers who really don't charge much of a premium, you know, maybe a hundred or 200 bucks a year, you know, something relatively minimal because from their view, you know, we've got a big portfolio here. They kind of get it. 
and the risks are kind of the same, right? So your risk of hurricane or hail or what have you, you know, a tree falling down, hitting the house are independent of, of use. Um, Houston, you know, Florida, we're a little bit newer in those markets. It, it depends a lot on the insurer, but many are just looking at it and saying, look, this is, this is a rental. If there's a criminal act between two people, we're not going to be liable for it because it's a criminal act between two people. And that's always been the big concern. Uh, but it's uh, in general, insurance rates are, are really comparable to just traditional kind of investor policies. And what are we putting keypads on each door to ensure? So not on the interior doors, we recommend, we're, again, we're, we're agnostic in terms of our platforming, select the lock type. Um, what I recommend just as, a, as someone who's done it is smart lock on the exterior door. So you want a keypad lock so that you can control access, delete codes, that kind of thing. But on interior doors, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, I actually prefer privacy locks with a, with a door chain. And the idea is, you know, you have these houses, uh, you, know, you have hollow core doors. Anyone could get through them if they so desire. And the idea is if, if you have, you know, we've, we've done everything. We've had keyed locks, we've had punch pad locks, we've, you know, we've done all sorts of things. And what we found, uh, you know, keyed locks are a huge problem because people lock the keys in their room all the time. And then it inevitably happens at 2 a.m. on a Friday. No one's happy. So that's, that's kind of a bad idea. People have done it. I've done it. But it's, uh, but it's a bad idea. Deadbolts are, in my opinion, against code in most places and are a fire hazard. And certain jurisdictions, like New York City, for example, you can't have locks on interior doors. Um, not that we have anything in New York City at the moment. But, um, but I like privacy locks because we found, uh, again, counterintuitively, that it actually makes the houses work a little bit better. So the idea being, if you and I live in a house together and I've got a deadbolt and three locks and I've got you know my own safe space, I can kind of be a jerk in a common area and then I've got my space and I can lock it up. Whereas if I don't really have that, we need to work out our you know differences as adults and I need to kind of be a kinder, gentler, more compassionate human being. So we found that those, those houses tend to be a little bit cleaner, be a little bit, uh, you know, operate a little more harmoniously. I still like the door chain mostly for, uh, for female members. It, it gives them a sense of security that, hey, you know, I've, I've got a, a backstop here and so on that's a little bit more secure, which I, I think is totally reasonable. But it, you know, kind of forces people to say, hey, I'm, I'm in this. I'm going to have to solve this as a, as a group rather than, you know, as a person who has my own space. Okay, and, and I'm sorry, I'm rapid firing here. Just okay. fascinating, and I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of your time. Um, average increase in utilities, have you tracked that at all? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I could give a, a general cost. I mean, you're going to have higher spend than, uh, I mean, certainly, I mean, most landlords aren't even thinking about what the increase is because they typically aren't paying the utilities, or if they are, sometimes maybe water in an apartment or something like that. But um, utility spend tends to be, you know, several hundred dollars a month, you know, in single family homes. You know, it's, uh, but because you're controlling the thermostat and because you're putting in low flow uh, fixtures, it tends to be relatively controlled. Some houses are a lot better than others. Uh, we see a pretty wide level of variation, to be honest. Um, part of that is just due to construction methods. Some investors are much more conscientious about, say, air sealing the property or, you know, actually checking the insulation, you know, in the in the attic. Uh, and others are are not, <laughs> to be to be clear. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've uh, we have a tool that underwrites it for each property that that pulls from uh, from different municipalities. But yeah, it's. Uh, it's typically a little bit higher than if, say, a family were there, just because you have more folks, more showers, and so on. But um, I don't know. I mean, I I have six people living in my house right now, so uh, and even though my my kids maybe don't bathe all that much, you know, <laughs> we have a pretty high utility bill. So uh, I don't know. It's uh, and and you see a lot of local variation. I mean, even just here, you cross a county line and your water bill can double. So nope. now. Do you have to provide any type of laundry service in the unit? So we recommend, it's part of the listing, but we recommend having a washer and dryer in the, in the property. Not required. Some, 
some place, you know, we have apartments that just don't, aren't hooked up for it, that kind of thing, not a big deal. It just needs to be in the listing and accurate. Um, but it is something that people value having it there, but not in terms of uh, like a linen service or, or actually doing any of the, and linens are not provided. Um, and some of that's for tax purposes. So for example, in Georgia, if you provide linens, you have to pay hotel tax and that would be bad. So, um, so yeah, no linens, people bring their own linens, but, um, and so hosts aren't doing any laundry for anybody. They aren't doing towels or, or anything like that. It's on the, the members in the house, but usually a washer and dryer are, are on site. And how about like, you know, cable bills and like, is it traditional, you know, standard cable package is, is the deal or? Yeah, so what, what we found uh, is just Wi-Fi is provided in these houses. So cable is tough because you got the boxes and all these different things and it's, it's a pain. Um, so we don't do cable. Um, if someone really wanted to, we, we wouldn't stop them, but our recommendation is Wi-Fi. That's enough for most people. And the thing is people aren't moving in, a, you know, they're furnished units. So they aren't bringing in a ton of furniture or anything else, or they're not allowed to bring in furniture. So, you know, people aren't bringing in TVs typically or that kind of thing. You know, they can watch on a computer, an iPad, or if they have a TV, that's fine. But it's, uh, you know, we say, hey, get a fire stick, get a, get a Roku, get one of those things and use the Wi-Fi. Cool. Uh, cost. What is the cost to the landlord? So we, we charge a percentage of revenue. Um, now, I, I guess we'll take it. The, obviously, the cost of the asset is the cost of the asset. You know, that's part of what our team is, is designed to do the pro forma with you and that kind of thing. Obviously, a lot of market variation on that. But um, again, you hear me say Airbnb a lot. It's because we, we copied a lot from them. Uh, they're worth a bit more than we are, to be, to be fair, but we're, we're trying to get there. Um, but we do exactly what they do. We take 12% of revenue, um, which we took from them. So again, we don't, there are no listing fees. There's no uh, setup fees, implementation fees. You know, emailing me and asking me to walk a property is free. I'm usually, I'll, I'll walk them. Uh, that's also free. But uh, yeah, we, we take 12% of, of revenue. And how does someone become a preferred vendor for you guys? Um, very, very simply. I mean, we have a staff that is doing that outreach and training. If someone... You know, we're, if anything, we're seeking preferred vendors um, more so than they are seeking that certification. So if someone's very interested in doing this and being a general contractor uh, who does pad splits or property manager or, or lender or insurance company, uh, you can reach out to me and I, I put you in touch with our team. We're always eager to grow that network and, and grow that ecosystem. So is there a way as an investor, I can, I can connect with you guys and find out you know, where you have the highest demands, you know, if I want to go target some assets and try this out, is that data available to me? It is. Yeah. You can, we, we can have that conversation. No problem. All right. So, I mean, it, this seems like a, a hell of a program to, to be honest. I, I love the innovation. I love the leverage of technology. It seems like you, you guys have really fully baked this thing out um, and I, I think with where we're headed, um, especially when this bubble bursts, cause, cause it's bursting, um, there's going to be real huge opportunity in this space. So, uh, I wish you guys absolutely continued success and, and best of luck. And if it's okay, I, I would like to reach out to you offline and just see if we can coordinate on a few of these markets and see if we can give it a try. Absolutely. That'd be great. If you could just one more time, just the best way to find the platform or you, if you'd like, what's, how do yeah. people find you? Best way to find the platform is padsplit.com, P-A-D-S-P-L-I-T.com. Um, you can set up an account. If you do so, one of our sales reps will reach out to you, I promise. Um, or you can reach out directly to me and I'm just Frank, F-R-A-N-K at padsplit.com. This, uh, this was great. I really appreciate your time. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me. Best of luck. Thanks. All right, everyone. As always, stay safe.